Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. I just heard one. Where's the rest of you? I think we need to stretch some legs. I'm really not getting much reaction yet. So let's try again. How are you? Good. That's better. Um, I'm Yaku. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, thank you for God. One big thank you there, and that's towards yourself. I think if anybody did a lot of work to make this conference happen, it's Malcolm. Um, a lot of passion and a lot of effort that has gone into this the last few weeks. So thanks, Malcolm. I think that deserves a round of applause, people. Because <laughs> Malcolm insisted that I should say a little bit... So yeah, apparently these don't work quite as well as they should. He said I need to say something about myself. So I'm the CEO of InterXL and Ultimate Linux Solutions who owns InterXL. I've been using Linux for the last 18 years. Um, I actually attended a programming contest down in Cape Town at the time where I got introduced to it. By 2003, I was hooked. I pretty much didn't use anything else anymore. I write a lot of code and get involved in some open source projects from time to time, submitted quite a few patches to the, back to the industry as well, and obviously we utilize and leverage quite a bit of open source. Okay, so my talk today is about simplicity, redundancy, and reliability, and these concepts are very frequently very confusing, so we will look at some definitions quickly. These things are, very, in many cases, very conflicting. We'll see why. Um, and we're going to try and see how we can improve and how we need to look at these things from a business perspective as well. So, and then we'll hopefully get to a conclusion and hopefully I'll be able to answer some questions that you may have. So if we ask Google about simplicity, then it will simply come back and say it's the quality or condition of being easy to understand or do. Okay, so it's quite easy to sit down on the chair, not quite so easy to stand up here and speak about these things. Okay, in our context, we can refer to code, we can refer to implementation and architecture, or even ease of administration, and if we really want to push it, customer use. So very frequently, we have an application, it needs input from customers, you know the drill, customer do something wrong, it goes completely belly up, but at least the code is easy to understand. Reliability, and this is where it kind of goes pear-shaped. The quality of being trustworthy or of performing consistently well. This obviously refers to two different, two different options there. Firstly, we obviously need correct results, and we need the results to be available when we need it. So if Google suddenly stopped answering questions that we ask it, I think most of us would be very, very lost. So we would like them to be available and we really want them to give us the correct answers. Redundancy, how do we define that? Okay, Google says, the state of being not or no longer needed or useful. In other words, you can be replaced. Um, there's quite a number of you down there. So if a couple of people were to leave, we'd still have a conference. However, if the speakers up here were to leave, it would be kind of more difficult. Okay, so it speaks to being able to switch off components without affecting the overall reliability. That switch off can either be intentional, if we're looking to do maintenance, or it can be accidental, server blows up or fails for whatever reason. It implies we're fault tolerant. So things can go wrong, customers don't know, which is obviously what we all want. Um, things do go wrong, so we just don't want our customers to necessarily know that. I would like to argue that these things are a little bit conflicting. You can have simple, but you probably won't have those and all of the other nice things, so we kind of need to try and find a balance. Um, so in order to explore this, I decided let's look a bit at redundancy and simplicity. So the more stuff we have, the more cogs and wheels we have in order to be able to deal with redundancy and have more components so that things can fail, the more complex they get, the interactions get really, really nasty. Code needs to be able to work in parallel. We need to succeed at failing, which is quite an odd concept. Um, so when things fail, they've got to fail properly and elegantly so that other things can kind of take over. And that very frequently doesn't happen quite the way we want. Um, yeah, redundancy also has an increased administrative effort. Very simply put, there's more stuff. If stuff fails, we kind of need to know about it, so we need to have additional and correct and accurate monitoring. 
and our system administrators need to understand how all of these wheels fit together. So it complexity goes up. However, if I were a system administrator, I think the simpler network would be that one to administer. Very nice and simple, switch server, firewall, we're done, we're good to go. As a business owner, however, I would like that, and I would like that to work reliable. So basically, I can switch off anything there, I can break any of the links, and there should, in theory, be no impact to customer experience. If we look at simplicity and reliability, we want simpler code, we want everything to be easy, we want, well, it must just work. The reality, however, is it's not quite that easy. Simple code we can validate, it's easier to look at, it's very easy to see, yes, it's correct or no, it's not. Simpler code, better. However, more complex environments, server parallelism, multi-threading, all of those kind of throw that out of the door and it gets a bit more involved. Fault tolerant code also, so if external components fail, our code needs to be able to deal with that. So, no, it's not quite that easy. It does get a little bit more involved, quite a bit more complex. So, no. Okay, so what I've done to illustrate this, simple parallel multi-threaded program that literally all it does is it increments a variable. It happens to be a global variable, which we all know we generally try to avoid. And then we go and measure the accuracy once it's done. Sounds easy enough, so we've got a little bootstrap function. So for those that don't understand code, which can I get an idea of how many people here have written code in the past? Should be pretty much everybody. Okay, so I don't need to explain too much. Basically, we will call the increment function i number of times and it should just work. So the first and simplest approach, have our global counter and we just increment it and we return. So if that call gets called, couple hundred times, we should have the right result. Works perfectly in a single threaded environment, 100 million increments, and we get the right result. However, as soon as we go higher, that result goes out the door. So, more complex environment, suddenly it just gets more involved. This system actually had four cores, so that explains the 25% accuracy. If you had 16 or 32 cores, that would go down even further. So this is, has to do with memory access. So C++ has this nice concept of volatile, which basically says don't optimize memory access, don't cache variables in registers and all of those things. If you're naive, you might think that'll solve the problem. Turns out it's actually worse. Performance-wise, stays about the same. So we still get about 550 million increments per second, 350 under contention. That one I don't quite understand, and I don't yeah. quite get why it's worse, but we'll yeah. Was it? Yeah. yeah, like so. Sorry, there's a second mic on you. That right. doesn't seem quite right. Uh, no, it wouldn't. It was adjusted for a right ear. Call. There we go. So a well-positioned microphone Thank here you. where you're not breathing. Call. <laughs> but it sounds OK. OK, someone's hijacking um, the system. <laughs> somewhere and okay thanks Quibus <laughs> in the I kind of expected that from the laser point that's not from the AV system this is where sound is controlled yeah if it seems Obviously, the right solution is anybody that I've written any kind of multi threaded code is to actually grab a lock, increment the counter, and release the lock. So that actually does work and it gets us 100% accurate results. But if we look at the cost there, even uncontended, we're dropping about 90% performance. So things get really, really slow. As soon as we start hitting contention, it gets even worse. Okay, so that gets us an idea of the cost of scaling, the idea of the cost of multi threading. And Towards that end, quite a few projects have recently started saying, well, let's just ditch multi-threading completely and stay single-threaded. Things like Memcached and Redis until recently have just completely said, listen, we're going single-threaded, done, that's it, blah. Because the cost of performing these kind of things are just really, really expensive. As an aside, the kernel has a very interesting way of dealing with a specific problem when it comes to counters, which they call atomic variables. 
it's architecture specific and it still doesn't quite get us to the original performance but it's still a quite a bit better than what we had um, with the locked case doesn't really matter still gets us 100 percent performance reliability and redundancy was a bit more tricky to try and balance and i did eventually come up with an idea which i hope will illustrate the point Improved reliability requires less redundancy. So if stuff works really well, we don't need redundant systems. If it doesn't break, why have the backup? Okay, improved redundancy, the stuff still needs to be reliable. Reli yeah, sorry, reliable. It doesn't help we have all of the redundancy in the world, but our components are failing left, right, and center. Um, but it does mean we've got some more time to react to those failures. So in a typical configuration that we run, two switches servers have dual uplinks. In an active standby configuration, usually switches that support multi-chassis link aggregation are a bit more expensive, so customers tend to not quite want to fork that out. Active link, backup link, go and install a new server, technician comes around and kind of kills our link and we end up in a degraded scenario, actually completely dead, so our link has failed. Fortunately, the server is configured, it detects the failure, cuts over to the backup link and we are back online. Usually that happens in a few milliseconds, so usually nobody notices. However, if we don't have monitoring, neither will we. So there we need that additional complexity again to know that that link is down so that we can go and repair it. Once we've repaired it, we're nice and optimal again. What gets more interesting is if we don't have a link failure, but a switch failure where the link remains up. In that case, we can end up in a situation where the switch is no longer switching packets, the link is up and the server is using the wrong switch. Again, we're dead in the water unless we've got some kind of way to know that we need to fail over, and standard bonding doesn't do that. Simplicity is a difficult one as well. It's kind of one of those things where it's kind of self-conflicting. If I make it simpler for in one area, it tends to have more complexity in another. So we need to kind of balance these costs as well and try and figure out where, to, to where the simplicity needs to be. So it gets really, really tricky. An example that I always use is a professor at the University of Pretoria once told me, when Linux admins brag about serious server uptimes, he considers their systems to be very insecure. And his motivation was that if you just update the packages, the vulnerable software still remains in memory. So you kind of need to reboot in order to make sure that the updates you've just installed actually becomes live and that you have a secure system. That is a task that can actually be automated. It is actually quite trivial to detect whether such binaries is running or not. However, to automate the process of restarting all of those binaries is not quite so easy. So we tend to kind of find those binaries and then manually restart these processes. So we can f write the code, just not that easy to do it. If we take a look at redundancy, most of us really don't want to struggle with that kind of network. It is quite complex to administer. We prefer doing that. So what the virtual environments do, they will do that for us, and then we can, to an extent, do that. So Azure and AWS and so forth, they've got nice redundant infrastructure. They deploy that, and we then deploy those kind of things on top of those environments. And if things at the hardware layer fails, they will just move your VMs and keep it up and running. It does not deal with software failure on your side that you are still responsible for. Failing, as it turns out, is not that easy. Things don't tend to fail cleanly, they tend to fail partially. Um, as we've seen in the threading example, we tend to get wrong results rather than no results or correct results. So we kind of need to make a plan to deal with that in many cases. When things go down, they should go down properly. It needs to be detectable. Okay, so in the threading example, my initial drafts actually had a problem. They got about 99.99% accuracy. When I tracked that down, it turned out the threads were terminating faster than what I was able to spawn them. So I had to synchronize them to spawn the whole lot and then make them all start running at the same time. The question really becomes, what are your requirements? What are you aiming to achieve? Why do you need redundancy? Is it simply to have it? Is it a term that you've heard and now need to implement? Simplicity, for whom? Do we care about the system administrator that needs to figure stuff out? Do we care about the developer that needs to deal with the complexity of locking? Where 
what are we trying to get rid of? Where does it need to become simpler? Reliability, uptime. Okay, we've seen uptime doesn't necessarily mean good systems because stuff can have 100 years uptime, but if it's not accessible or if it's giving wrong results, it doesn't help. Um, so the question really becomes in what respect, what accuracy level, especially when we start working with things like machine learning, at what accuracy levels are these results good enough? There's cost implications to each of these things. So unreliable systems generates bad reputation, customers tend to go elsewhere. Redundant system costs in terms of increased infrastructure and increased maintenance efforts. Can't just change the configuration on one switch, we've got to do it on two or three or four, depending on how, how wide we're going. There's complex use cases for customers, so if the customer needs to do things in a very specific way in order for things to work, it kind of going to blow up in your face. Again, the customer doesn't like to struggle. If it's difficult, they go elsewhere. So it has to be simple for the customer and has to be available. It has to work. Last year at a point on Facebook, I made a statement that said, I can't imagine that there are many things in life quite as complex as simplicity. At the time, I don't think I've quite realized the implication of that. I've since come to learn that things are way, way more complicated than what even I realized. And to make things easier for customers is really, really difficult. Um, you kind of need to understand everything. You need to understand how people think. You need to understand what people want, what they need, what will enhance their businesses. So you have to understand where, the, where your customers are coming from, what they need in order to be able to do this. And I would like to leave you with something that Albert Einstein said. He mentioned everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I think that is quite appropriate. Um, so we need all of these things, but we can't really always get all of it. So we need to kind of balance where things ends up. And that's it from my side. So are there any questions? If there's no questions, I think I would like to just say thank you for not having too many questions. <laughs> Quibbis. Okay, so at what level? Okay, so typically we will ensure that we have at least two independent uplinks. Uh, preferably to two independent switches on the provider side. Those will come into separate switches on our side and each and every server will have a redundant pair so we can literally take one server out, literally just take it and yank it out um, and everything should fall over to backup, all of the switches, everything. Uh, so that complex network that we've shown, that is essentially what we implement as far as possible. Especially when you work with, with voice and data routing and stuff, people don't, it's Downtime is not an option. It has to be available. Sure, that's a difficult question. Mm, yes and no. So there's some tasks that we do automate. We have scripts that run and check for certain things and then take corrective action kind of automatically. These are built custom most of the time depending on the required task that needs to be done. I know there are tools like Ansible and so forth that get your deployments done and can perform certain tasks and get the stuff done. And I believe there is someone doing a talk today on Ansible. Oh, you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that's a bit tricky. Um, everybody's requirements are unique. So you kind of need to make sure that your application requirements drive what you've got there. So if one of the needs is to make sure that your voice customers are protected, you kind of need to have something in place to detect when they get hacked. And hacked, they will get hacked. Um, and if you can detect that. So it, it's tasks, tasks in that respect are pretty much application driven. You can't just have a blanket approach to everything. One of the basic stuff is Obviously, server updates is one of those tasks that all of us need to do. So those can, to an extent, be automated. We tend to prefer to do them semi-manually. So we will have a script driving the process, but we will still kick off that script by hand so that we can kind of check, okay, 
all of the redundant systems are active. There's no degraded systems. Okay, let's run the updates. But the process is still somewhat automated in that it is contained inside of a script. Does that answer your question? <laughs> okay, so there is a file hierarchy standard, just so for the sake of the recordings and stuff. What you're basically saying is that you've got a standard layout that you guys use, and by just looking at that single folder, you can already figure out exactly what the server does. So what we generally do is we run netstat, and that'll give us an idea of what services are running on the host, and then we'll take it from there to work it back. Um, so we, yeah, we do get into especially in consulting scenarios, we get customers that don't know what's going on. The lead system administrator have just literally overnight packed up and left, and then you kind of need to assist those customers to figure out what's actually going on. It gets a bit tricky because it's really an audit that you're doing, but it's not an audit, so fortunately people are more accommodating in those circumstances. Uh, when you try start doing security audits and stuff, and I think Marco and them will be able to agree, they tend to get very, very defensive very quickly. So when people have upped and left, and they kind of need to figure out what's going on, they're much more accommodating, they will help you in a much easier manner. Um, so there are ways to deduce what's going on, um, but it does take time, yeah. Uh, how do you fail reliably? <laughs> <laughs> You find a failure that doesn't fail reliably and you fix it. Um, <laughs> okay, so we had a few, yeah, I think it was about a year back. Um, we used the asterisk management interface to get information out of a running asterisk. For those of you that don't know, asterisk can trivially consume about 8,000 file descriptors on a moderately busy system. Uh, for each voice stream passing through it, it can easily use, I think it's about four sockets. If you're using SIP over TCP, that goes up. Um, even more, so it gets to be a lot of sockets. So if your file descriptors run out, the kernel will return, can't remember what the error is, but it'll basically tell you, no, you can't have this file descriptor. And the thread that L Asterisk used would take that error, it would terminate the thread, but not close the socket. So Asterisk would end up accepting the connections, but not having a thread available to process those, and it would just end up being a total mess. Um, tracking that down was quite a difficult one, but fortunately somebody else solved it a few days before we bumped into it. So Google did manage to answer that one, but it did take a few hours. <laughs> it becomes really, really difficult. As <laughs> As we've seen, just adding the locking took away about 90% of our performance, but we can only get so far with a single thread. So now we have to multi-thread. If there's no contention, things are generally okay. But as soon as we start hitting those contention points and there's contention on the locks, then we kind of need to... Th just doubling the processing power won't necessarily give us double the performance unless we plan these things really carefully. And both, so we kind of want to scale horizontally to an extent but we also want to layer things so that they depend on each other so that even for a single request, things can kind of happen in parallel. So the database needs to be busy with some stuff whilst we're busy calculating other stuff and other things are pulling other stuff for us and kind of just combine it at the end. But yeah, it's the interactions between these things get hairy very, very quickly. Depends on the application. For me personally, the big advantage of, the, of virtual machines is not having to deal with the hardware. So somebody else takes care of that. It does not, and a lot of people that I speak with don't get this. They think, okay, we're just gonna put everything on a VM and it solves all of our problems. It doesn't. It takes care of your hardware, but hardware is 99% of the time not your problem. It depends on how you use them and what your purpose is. Um, 
a couple of years back and I haven't done the checks again, I would not deploy voice on a VM at all. And the simple reason for that was scheduling was just unpredictable. So in most applications, if your application doesn't schedule for 50 or 50 or 100 milliseconds even, it's not a major crisis. If I'm busy speaking to you and our uh, voice switch doesn't get scheduled for 100 milliseconds, that's a gap in audio. It sounds bad and it gives a bad customer experience. So it really depends on your, your um, requirements. Database service as well I'm a little bit more skeptical about. Although I must say the, the disk throughput has improved and the disk latency has improved quite a lot. But the database service as well is one of the areas where it's a bit more tricky. Yes? <laughs> well, is there? Because that chip can still be on your hardware. And if you can't see it, so what you really want is some other device that's sitting on your network and monitoring what's actually going in and out. On the other hand, as they always say, if you're not doing anything evil, why do you care if people are monitoring you? Okay. Not currently, no. Um, before Docker became a viable solution, even for Asterisk, we kind of developed our own solution. And as it turns out, the Docker use case for that doesn't really solve our problem. And the people are having major problems with Asterisk inside Docker, so we're sticking with what we've got there. And haven't had another need for it, so. Yes. Sure, okay, so the question is about reliability of different operating systems. Are you referring inside Linux environments or cross-platform like in between Windows and Linux, a Mac OS X? Well, so different that you uh, 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 That's a very easy on question to answer. Who's your system administrator? Go with whatever he prefers because he's going to know that best and he's going to be able to give you the best performance and best reliability with that. Any system, no matter how reliable, if your system administrator can't keep, do the necessary upkeep, you're going to have problems. So if you've got an admin that is more comfortable in the Linux environment, use a Linux-based solution. If you've got someone that understands Windows really well, use Windows Hypervisor. That's a skill set issue more than a technical one. Most of the operating systems nowadays are very reliable. Any, any other questions? Okay, looks like we uh, ran out now. And I believe that means it's time for coffee. And if you have any other questions that we weren't able to answer here or that um, you would prefer not to ask publicly, I will be outside, let us know. <laughs> Thank you.